Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining me today in Mentoring 101. I guess I should kick things off by introducing myself. My name is Elle Marquez and I'm the Community Architect for Operation Safe Escape. We're a 501c3 dedicated to helping victims of domestic violence through education and training in order to be able to get back their digital lives. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys might have about that. I'll be hanging out in Slack. But when people ask me who I am, that isn't what I say because that's what I do. When people ask me who I am, why well, say, hi, I'm Ello Punk and I'm a professional noob. That might be a strange title, but it really is what I believe myself to be. I will never be a subject matter expert. And that's simply because I don't want to be. I love learning new things. I love the adventure and breaking things and failing miserably and then figuring it all out. The pride that comes from success after failure. But to be honest with you, I never take this road alone. I don't believe that I should have to reinvent the wheel in order to learn something. So what I've done is I've been able to rely on the community, to be able to ask questions and get help and find my foundation in mentoring. And so what I'm here today is not to give you the tools or the skills that you need to be the best mentor or the best mentee. Because honestly, guys, you already have them. What I'm here to do today is to teach you how to better wield these tools. So you may be wondering, all right, well, how are you gonna do that? Our agenda today is pretty simple. What I'm gonna be doing is I'm going to be telling you a story, and that's my story. And I don't do it to tell you, oh, look how amazing I am, or feel bad for what has happened. I do it so that you can use it as a template, as a prompt, as whatever you need to be able to further your adventure without having to commit the same mistakes that I have. Now, every good story begins with an origin, and mine begins in a small town in Mexico. You see, my parents were migrant workers, so I had the joy of living here and living in Mexico. And some might say, in fact, they do say, that I came from a disadvantaged background. But I don't see it that way. I see it as I had a very happy childhood. Yes, I lived off the grid, but that was simply because there was no grid to speak of. But every good story has to have a turning point. And so I found mine when I was in my 20s and my partner, my husband had left and I was sitting there with three kids, no job history, no skills to be able to rely on outside of those that I had learned on the farm. Luckily, I found a boot camp called the Linux for Ladies program. Now, this was a six weeks intense boot camp designed to teach the basic intricacies of Linux administration, MySQL, and Apache to a group of women with little to no tech skills. But I did it. I enrolled. And you know something? I was successful in those six weeks. But the way that I did it was by relying on the rest of the women there. Now, we all had our own skills and we all had those things that we excelled at and those things that we did horribly at, but we didn't focus on that. We focused on what we did well. We specialized in that. And then we stayed after class and taught one another. And somebody would teach me about my SQL queries and I would sit there going like, that's not even English. And somebody else would stand up and go, okay, what she's trying to say. And we'd work together to educate one another and to help us grow. Later, I came to believe that that is an aspect of what we now call cohort mentoring. No, there weren't specific mentors assigned, but maybe there were. Those individuals who exceeded at that task were the mentors for that moment. Now, every story, though, has to have a good villain. Oh, before we move on, in case any of you guys were watching, that's me right there. <laughs> But every good story has to have a villain. And unfortunately in this story, the villain is the community because it wasn't long until I started hearing that I was nothing more than a publicity stunt, that the work that I had done, that the certification that I had received, that the job I'd managed to obtain at Rackspace, who Forbes 500 called at the times, the job that I'd managed to get at Rackspace, who at the time was touted as one of the hardest industries, one of the hardest companies to get even a job interview in, was simply because I was the diversity hire. It was only because of Linux for Ladies and the publicity around it that I'd accomplished anything. And what that did was that planted a seed of doubt inside of me. And later I would figure out that that seed is what I think grew into imposter syndrome. 
you know, something my kids had gotten used to eating. So I went through and I said, all right, I'm going to do this job and I'm going to do it to the best way that I can. So I dove in and six months after this all occurred, my tickets were reviewed by a colleague on a different shift. And his review that went to myself and to my manager was simply... <laughs> Even to this day, those words hurt because as you can imagine, it spurred that inside of me. It was the water that grew that seed, or as I like to say now, it was the fertilizer that helped grow that seed of imposter syndrome. So I went in that day ready to quit. I was done. I didn't want to do this anymore. So I sat at my desk wondering, how do I leave this job with a little bit of dignity? How do I stop being that diversity card and letting people know that it got to me finally? So I was quiet and I'm looking at my screen and one of my teammates rolls over and goes, <laughs> would you break? After all, it's the only reason I'm going to be quiet, right? And I had a moment then. So if you've been checking your email now or looking at your phone, I want you to tune in right now because this might be the most important talk or most important part of this presentation. Because what I had then was a moment. And it was a moment that we've all had and we all will have again. And that's, do you tell the truth? Or do you do what we all do and just shrug it off and say, oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about it but I had nothing left to lose. So I told him what had happened. And what I realized now is I took that moment and I passed it on to him. Now he could have just said what we all say, oh, you know, that sucks, I'm so sorry, things like that happen. He doesn't know what he's talking about and moved on with his day. But what I'm glad he did is he took that moment and he said, you know what, let me take a look at those tickets and I'll give you a real review, something more than four words. So off he went. About an hour later, he comes back and he says, no, look at these tickets. I can see exactly what he's saying because, yeah, week one, week two, you could have been automated. You were just giving statistics. But look here, you started looking for answers and you started giving them to him. He's like, well, look at two months ago. You got mad and you just started solving the problems for them. I think you're ready to grow. Here's a few scripts. Here's a few tickets I think they would work on. Why don't you review these and ask me questions as you go along? Now, I want you to notice something. There wasn't any type of mentorship mentioned in any of that, but what he became is the hero of my story. That's Aaron, and yes, he gave me permission to use that photo. Aaron would come by and even without me asking, just say, hey, how are you doing? Do you understand that script? And in time, even though I never said, Aaron, will you be my mentor? Or he never said, you know what? I'm your mentor, let's plan out your career. It really is what he became. Because to me, a mentor is someone who helps you fill those knowledge gaps, who helps you seek opportunities to grow and excel. That's exactly what he was doing. You know, a mentor is someone whom you can let down your guard. That's that moment of vulnerability that I was talking about. It's someone who you can share your insecurities and ask all those stupid questions that we all have sometimes. And I know everybody says, oh, don't worry, there isn't such a thing as a stupid question. Yeah, but when you're the one asking it, it sure does feel that way. But you know what ended up happening is my whole team grew. Because I would ask Aaron a question and he'd start giving me an answer. And after a time, Corey would chime in and say, the way that you need to look at it is. And then Kevin would come in from the back and tell Corey something he hadn't thought about. And then, of course, Avery had to jump in with something else. And so what happened was every time I asked a question, it became L story time. The entire group was growing and learning new things. Here's that concept again of that cohort mentoring without any official titles. And that really came to resolve in myself that the way we should look at mentorship is that it's there for a reason and a season and a lifetime. And what I need for you is for you to be that reason, for you to take that moment and step in, even if it's just a moment in time and it never goes anywhere else. That's still a mentor. That's still a teacher. That's still that moment in time when you can make a difference in someone's life. But these little moments, they become like seeds. And sometimes they're able to grow into a season. Now, I loved my work with Aaron, and I'm still very close and we're great friends. But what came out of that is I learned that Corey, Corey taught in the way that I learned. He told things in parables and in stories. And <laughs> if you haven't figured it out, that's the way that I learn in stories. 
And so we kind of grew into a season because it was a time that I no longer wanted to be a Linux admin. I was so tired of it. So I went to him and I said, Corey, I want to be a level two admin. I want to grow. I want to look for something else. And within that, he said, OK, let's sit down. Let's look at the leveling exam. Let's see what positions they're open and we'll kind of help you delve through it. He didn't do it for me, but he gave me the tools that I needed to be able to do it for myself. So we're about halfway through this talk now, and some of you are like, all right, Elle, great. You've had a great upcoming. You've had great mentors and teachers, but that's not what I came to learn about. What I came to learn about is how do I do that? Like, how do I get a mentor? Well, if you've been listening, this isn't going to come to a surprise to you. And honestly, some of you might not like this answer. And that's you have to quit looking for mentors. Mentors have become such a formal relationship. When I hear about some of these mentoring programs that are like A and B, you will meet for six months and you'll have these goals and you'll accomplish these things. Like that almost seems like an arranged marriage to me. And if you only have six months or three months or six weeks to figure that out, that's way too much stress. Now, I'm not going against formal mentorship companies or formal mentorship programs. That might work for some in the small amount of time, but I really think that we need to learn to go beyond that if we're truly looking for growth. So what you need to look for is I think you need to look for teachers. Now, I'm not saying that a teacher can't be called a mentor, but what I'm saying here is that you need to look for someone, as I like to say, that speaks your English. We all don't learn the same way. And there are people out there who are geniuses, who are masters in their field, who can explain things and draw them out and write white papers. And they'd be absolutely no good to me because I don't learn that way. I would struggle. I need people who talk in stories, who tell tells, who explain the OSI model to me like a post office, because that's a lesson that Corey gave me that I will never forget. And when you find those people, take your moment, go up, ask that question. Don't be afraid. The worst thing that happens is they say no and they blow you off. And guess what? You're in the exact same place that you were to begin with. And though when you ask those questions, make sure to ask more. I have people that come up and they ask me something and I explain it. I can kind of see that they're lost and I'm trying to recalculate how to explain it better. And they go, oh, thank you. And they walk off. And I'm like, I know you didn't understand that. Why don't you follow up? But people are so afraid of seeming like they're asking the same question or perhaps seeming dumb or feeling that they don't know anything and they never will, that they don't ask that follow up. I am great at saying, OK, so every third word that you said was English. Can we go from explain it like I'm 10 to explain it like I'm five, please? And if I truly don't understand because our methods don't work, I will go and ask 10 different people the same question until I find someone who can explain it to me the way that I need, who can give me the foundation. And you know what? Sometimes go and ask 10 people because maybe you'll get a more well-rounded answer that way. And after that, when you ask their help though, understand what it's asking. One of the hardest parts for me is when people come up to me and they say, L, I loved your Docker course. I love the container course that you wrote. Help me get a job in containers. Okay. I don't know what that means. Do you want me to look at ads for you? Do you want me to send you jobs when they come my way? Are you wanting to know more about Docker? Uh, that's a lot of stress on me. I cannot write your career for you. But if you come with me, uh, come to me with very specific questions like, I want to work in Docker, but I'm having a very hard time understanding how networking is or how networking works. Could you lead me to some documentation? Could I reach out to you once I look at this documentation if I need further clarification? Yeah, those are things that I can work with. I'm not making a commitment to other than to, hey, let me send you some resources and answer a few questions. Those are moments that could definitely grow into something more. And they actually have when people have approached it the right way. And finally, this one's hard because it's going to be hard for everyone. Be open to failing. Sometimes you're going to make that approach and someone is going to blow you off. Someone's going to say, oh, that sucks that you don't understand that. And they're going to move on. It happens. Just because you gave the moment doesn't mean that they have to take it. I found an amazing mentor, right? A teacher who every time I asked him for help was so great at explaining things to me. And I thought, all right, I'm going to go for the certification. I'm going to ask him to help me. And when I went to him, he goes, I can't. I'm sorry. And I think he saw that look of hurt in my eyes because he said, it's because my wife is nine months pregnant. I'm about to go on paternity leave and she would kill me if I made that kind of commitment. 
I have embraced failure and I often tell people that I've made a career out of it. And it's because I was reading this book by Samuel Beckett and it was the most powerful quote to me because he said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, and fail better. You will never believe what you can accomplish by attempting the impossible with the courage to repeatedly fail better. This was a very powerful moment to me because it made me realize I will never accomplish anything in mentorship in my career if I don't just embrace that I'm gonna break things and it's gonna be awful, but someone can help me put it together. And I keep talking about goals and outing your questions and your adventure. And some of you may be going, I don't even know enough to know what that adventure would be. So let's break down how you're going to go about it. Now, some people have advised me to try bullet journaling, to try OKRs, to try dream boards. And those are all great if that's what works for you. But all of these are very abstract. And there's a way to get to a very distinct way, a very specific way at looking at those. Now, some of you are about to roll your eyes. I'm going to own that. But I love using SMART goals because SMART goals can be a breakdown of your bullet journal and what you're doing. SMART goals can be kind of an actionable way to get to your dream board. But I think that what people do wrong is that they teach SMART goals in a very kind of a box way. And the fact is that they don't have to be. Now, this works for me, but I recently took on a season with my one of my favorite mentees and God, she is such a free spirit. I could not put her in a box if I tried, but that's okay because we just shifted these to fit to her. You know, she wanted something that was significant in her life, something that was truly meaningful, something that she could action on. So we shifted this around to fit the way that she needed this tool to be. Do the same for you. Take some serious time thinking this through. I've seen a people that have even changed the word a little bit to fit the way that they need it to look like. So I'm gonna break down the way that I've approached this. And like I said, please just craft this to your style. But when I decided that I didn't wanna be an admin anymore, like honestly, I hated it. I thought, okay, well, I work at Rackspace. I, it's the managed cloud company. Let me learn the cloud. That's a dream. Like, how do I know when I know the cloud? What is the cloud? So I said, okay, I'm working at Rackspace and Rackspace developed the OpenStack technology that builds the cloud. So I'm gonna learn OpenStack. Strange editing point here. Sorry, my kids walked in. The joy of working from home these days. Let's get back to it though. I thought, all right, learning OpenStack, that, that's not really enough. How do I know what I'm doing? How do I know when I get there? So I needed something measurable. At the time, there was a certification test that was for an OpenStack administrator. That could work. I was either an OpenStack administrator or I wasn't. There was really no gray point there. It was something that was very measurable to me. Then I needed to ask, is this actually attainable for me? Well, I had three kids at home. I was working full time. I lived an hour from home. I was currently had a group of mentees or people that I was teaching. But it's something that I really wanted. It's something that I could make attainable. My kids would understand going to school, to studying. My mentees, they would understand that I needed to step away from my own personal growth. And really, I could make it work if I just dedicated the time to do so. All right, we could do this. So the next thing I needed to figure out is, is it realistic for me? Okay, the, uh, the test was written by Rackspace, that's a plus. Hey, we have a training team at Rackspace for administrators and we have a group of administrators. So I went up to the teachers and I said, I wanna do this, could you guys help me set a path? Oh, it's not that hard, it's actually broken down into domains. All you need to understand is what each of those domains are and be able to speak to them. It's a practical test, as long as you understand how the parts work, it should be simple enough. All right, well now I know that I'm gonna become an OpenStack certified administrator by taking things one domain at a time. This is looking a lot better for me, but this can still be a dream. Like how in, am I gonna accomplish this? This is one of those things that I say, it's gonna happen. And two years later, I'm thinking back like, I really wanted that to happen. And that's where the concept of time bound comes from. Now, did I mention that I hated being a Linux admin? I wanted out. So what I did next, I do not recommend, but if you can do it, more power to you. I said, I am gonna accomplish this goal within 60 days. 
And thanks to that amazing training team who kind of held my hand every time I broke something, and honestly, to my own studying, I was able to accomplish that. And a really interesting thing happened after that. I went up to tell the training team, hey, I passed, thank you for your help. And they said, we know the way you think now. Why don't you take that certification and come work for us? These were all moments that led up to a season that was an amazing time for me. Now, if you're thinking, that's cool. Like, I love how you got there. and I'm really comfortable where I am right now, but I want to give back. How can I use those tools to be a better mentor? Your job is actually really simple. And that's stop focusing on that. Let people grow on their own. It is called self-improvement, self-growth for a reason. What you need to be there is for those moments when you can help them along. My advice to you is simply be open, be honest, and be vulnerable. Be open to those moments when you see someone looking for help. If someone comes to you and asks for help, take the moment. You know, if it's five, 10 minutes, if you can't dedicate a lifetime, that's fine. Be honest about what you can do. And at the same time, when it comes to being honest, be honest about what you know. I can't tell you how many times my journey was set back because someone was unable to say, you know, I don't know, or I can't understand. So they would feed me lines that were just blatantly wrong. And I had to go back and figure that out later and be vulnerable. We all love to tell stories about how great we did and this thing that we fixed, but it's hard to be motivated when you're talking to somebody who doesn't know what it feels like to break things, somebody who's never failed the way that you have. And that's really easy to feed that imposter syndrome. Now, every good story, it has an end, right? And I also told you that this journey is for a lifetime. You've got your moment, your season, and a lifetime. I can't tell you the end of the story. I really can't because I'm not there yet. I'm five years into my tech career. The best parts, I think, are still to come. But what about a lifetime? I definitely feel like I've had a lifetime adventures. And remember Corey, who I told you about? He was there day one during my interview at Rackspace. He fought for me to be on his team. He led my, uh, led my adventures so many times. He truly has become my lifetime mentor. And by this, I mean I spoke to him shortly before I took this video. Every time I have a question on something that I don't know where to go to, say, hey, Corey, let me springboard something off of you. And if he knows it, he'll give me a bit of information and kind of set me on his way because after five years, he knows the way that I think. And if he doesn't know it, he goes, you know what? I know somebody. Let me get you in contact with them. Now, can I guarantee that this is all going to work for you? No. It's all about how you take this lesson, take this template, and write out your own story. But what I can tell you is if you really dedicate to it, you can, you can really write your own adventure. I keep saying that, but that's the way it feels. You can make the best out of everything that you have. Because in 2014, I didn't know what Linux was. And later that year, by October of that year, I was a Red Hat certified system administrator working at Rackspace. And not more than, what, two, three months later, I was a Red Hat certified engineer. None of these were done alone. They were all done by asking questions and asking for help and relying those around me. When I became an OpenStack trainer, I got to go to the summit, met a wonderful woman named Spots who helped me get on the mentorship team because I was really passionate about it. Shortly after I was asked to lead it, she worked at Linux Academy. Guess where I worked next? It's not just about context. It's about getting to know people, asking questions, and kind of inviting them to be on your journey. I was never more proud than when Operation Safe Escape asked that I could take the role because now I feel like I'm not only giving back, but I'm helping to change lives. That perhaps is the greatest adventure that I've had so far, and I can't even think about what 2021 will come. Hopefully you've enjoyed this story and I'm hoping that you guys have some questions. Normally this is an hour long talk that I've really condensed. So feel free to hit me up on Slack. I live on Twitter. I should be more embarrassed on that. I have my own website, email, like I am readily available. Please feel free to reach out with any questions and I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of the conference.
Hi, everyone. I wanted to say thank you so much for listening in. Um, I've had a few of you go ahead and ask some technical questions. If you can talk to me in Slack, I'd be so happy to share this moment with you. But the one question I wanted to make sure to answer live is how do you handle when you didn't connect with your mentor or mentee? Like, how do you end that relationship? And honesty, this is the part where you have to just step up and say, you know what, I don't think that we uh, teach and learn in the same way. I don't think that I can help further what you're doing. However, I would be happy to help you find someone who will. You help them by helping, you help them most by helping them take their next step. Help them understand what their question is, or maybe even draw out those SMART goals so that they can pursue their career and know that you know, just because this didn't work out, it's not on them. It didn't work out because people have different ways of speaking and teaching. Um, so I, I want to encourage everyone that the biggest part of being a mentor and a mentee is the honesty behind it. People will respect that, and they're going to be more willing to continue their journey because they don't feel like they have failed. Maybe even quote that uh, saying by Samuel Beckett and understand that we all fail in our journey, but that's just when we stand up and learn our lesson and keep going. Like I said, I'd be available on Slack and happy to answer any questions, but I've kind of pushed my time. So if you guys want to talk to me there, I'd be happy. Thank you.